So if you are one of our kiddos, you're welcome to follow Miss Julie over here to my left to slip out to Children's Church. And um, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to the book of Philippians. Um, we are going to be in chapter 4. So as you're flipping there, we get to talk about um, one of our favorite topics to ever discuss, which is conflict, because we all love conflict, especially me. It's like my favorite thing to preach on. So not really. I hate talking about this, but it's so important and is exactly what happens inside of our text. So let me start off by asking just a few questions. So here we go. When was the last time that you got into a disagreement with a person in your life? Better yet, have you ever gotten in an argument or a debate or disagreed with somebody to the point that it got so bad that you actually got hurt in a deep way. And your hurt was so great that it actually led to you having to create distance with that person, creating some kind of boundary with them. Uh, likewise, um, have you ever had any kind of disagreement with a person in church? Now, if you're new to church, you're not going to really understand this, and it is to your benefit. Let me, let me just tell you that. For those of us that have been in church for a season and a while, you know some of the meanest people in the world can be churchgoers. And so my question is, have you ever seen conflict in a church that was so great that led you to be so frustrated that you may have even walked away from the church? Or at least said that uh, all churches are filled with hypocrites or all churches are just the same? And maybe even your time here at the branch, or if you're here and you're listening online, is an effort for you to say, I'm going to give the church another chance. Uh, I'm going to see if this church is any different than the other churches. And so you're cautiously and hesitantly leaning in to what we're teaching and what we're saying and how we interact, and just to see if our body of Christ will be different than your experience and upbringing in the church you are coming from or, or the church that you were raised in. Um, th- so here's the truth, y'all. Um, conflict is a real thing that can create all kinds of heartache for us And the passage that we have today is going to address what we as Christians should do with conflict within the body of Christ. Now, the context of the passage is primarily between believers in a church. But I think that there are principles from this passage that certainly would apply to marriage or singleness or work and other places. But here's the big idea of the text. Conflict is unavoidable. You can't stop it. It's going to happen. But unity is something that you and I need to fight for. So go to chapter 4, look at verse 2. This is the shortest passage that we're going to teach through the entire time we've been in Philippians. But here's what it says. He says, I entreat Judea and I entreat Sintiki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So let's just work through a couple of very simple observations that the Word will guide us in how we think about this. So here's observation number one. The conflict in the church in Philippi, at least here, is between two women. But these aren't just like any kind of women. They are godly women. Uh, I don't know how to say the second lady's name. I try to say it with confidence when I read it. But Yudia and Sintiki, they do not agree in the Lord, and they've labored side by side, which implies that they've been doing church together for quite some time, meaning that these women cannot be characterized as lawless or carnal Christians. Uh, They've been serving in the church at least for months, if not years. So this is an important point, because when disagreement arises, it's always more difficult when the person's immature. So if this was like new Christians, you could understand why they were fighting and they couldn't figure it out because they've, they've never wrestled through what God has called them to be. But as far as we know, these women are like key leaders in the church. And then the text describes, tells a guy's name by Clement. Uh, so who is this Clement guy? His name's just kind of like jammed in there as this random guy that is serving with them in the church. Uh, well, one commentary I read from a guy named Moises Silva, he says that, that if you could read this passage in the original language, the name Clement 
when it's worded, would sound something like this. That Paul says that even Clement too struggled with me. Now if that's true, then that means that Clement's name in this passage is evidence that Paul is saying that I've got into an argument with Clement, and we struggled together, but we figured it out. And this Clement guy is in your church, ladies, and how we have figured it out, I pray that you too would also figure it out. It's good news that this thing can actually not go sideways, that there can be healing. The second thing that's really fascinating is, is we have no idea what they are fighting about, which is super cool and frustrating at the same time. So when the Holy Spirit wrote these words, God chose to not give us the details of what their disagreement is. And when Paul is working through of trying to help them navigate the disagreement, he doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of what they're fighting about. It's all ambiguous. And I think that's intentional. Here's why. You may not think this is true, but I know this is true. Y'all, we are prone when it comes to arguments and fights, and particularly when we want counsel, to say that our context is unique and your counsel doesn't apply to my context. So let me give you an example. If we said these were married women with their husbands and their fight was something between two married couples and you're in the room and you're single, you would go, well, the things that Paul says doesn't really apply to me because I'm single. Likewise, if we said these two women were single and they're fighting something that would be attached to singleness, all the married people in the room were prone to say, well, this doesn't really apply to my marriage because we kind of think context is king in America. But the problem with that way of thinking is is we miss out on hearing things that God wants us to know. Because here's the principle. Whatever has been your argument within the body of Christ, Christian to Christian. Now, if they're not a Christian, it's a different conversation. But if they're Christian to Christian, the principles that we're going to look inside of this text apply in some way, shape, or form. So we don't want to disregard it. The third observation is, and this is a rough one, the disagreement between these two ladies was so great that it had become public. So if Paul is addressing it, then it would mean that it was included in the letter, the report that Epaphroditus would have brought to him when he was in jail in Rome. That's how bad the fight would have been. Additionally, the book of Philippians would have been a letter that was read publicly to the congregation. And so you just got to wonder, like, what do they do when they get to this part and you're Yudia and Sinchiki in the room? Or you're somebody that has taken sides inside of that particular room. So it's a such a bad argument that it's causing, most likely, schisms and difficulties inside of the church. And look, the text doesn't say that people in the church are taking sides. But if it's a Baptist church, I can promise you there's people that took sides. Uh, so a good question would be is this. Why are these ladies fighting in the first place? Well, we don't know the details. And why do you get in arguments with your spouse? Why do you get in arguments with your kids? Why do you get in arguments with friends and family and co-workers? Like, where do fights come from? Well, James chapter 4, verse 1 tells us exactly where they come from, and I want to take a second and dissect that. Here's what James 4, 1 says. He asks this question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So here's what James says. James says that fights and arguments are a reality because of the desires of our hearts. So a good question would be, well, what does that mean? What desire in my heart creates tension and wants to fight? It, this is the way one counselor I read said. He says that the desires that are in our hearts, they rule me. They're too important. They're out of order, and they dominate our hearts. We don't just want something. We've got to have it. We want it too much, too desperately, and when we don't get what we want, we fight and we quarrel in order to get it. So let me give you the best example of that in my world. So in my world, I've got four kids. The common quarrel in my house is what TV show are we going to watch whenever we allow them to watch TV shows? So when we have these time frames of the, of the day where they can have screen time, inevitably, almost every single day, there are three kids, because the other one tries to fight, but she's too little, but the three kids... They want and desire the exact TV show that they want. And they are willing to fight and quarrel to the frustration of their parents to get the TV show that they want. And here's the thing. That's not a unique Helms kid thing. 
That's in every single one of our hearts. So the reason that we fight is because you and I are sinful, and we're broken, and we're selfish, and we have these desires at times that we're willing to fight for and to even hurt people over. And the truth is, as long as there are people, there'll be desires like this, which means as long as there are people with those desires, conflicts and arguments are always going to be a problem for you and I. So a simple application of that reality is this. You and I should not be shocked when we experience fights and disagreements in the world in which we live. Rather, we should expect them. That, the same counselor that I quoted earlier, here's what he says. He says, are you surprised that you face relational tensions? Don't be. In this life, count on conflicts. Why? Because we're fallen sinners living with fallen sinners in a fallen world. And one of the things that sinners do is sin. And often they sin against each other. So here's the truth, friends. You may have come to our church and you're thinking, finally I have found a church where people won't bicker and fight. And you need to know, we will bicker and fight in this church. Unless you're sinless. And I'm sinless. And I can promise you that's not the case on my end. And probably not the case on your end. So the question is not, will we get in fights in our church? The better question is, how do we respond in a gospel way when we do disagree? That's the better question. Because here's what this text is teaching. It is saying that you are going to get in arguments and fights if you're breathing. And the Bible teaches that those disagreements are an opportunity for you to look more like Jesus and do arguments and fights the way that God has called you to do them. So the question is not, will we fight? The question is, will we fight in a way that glorifies God? Will we fight for unity? So then he gives a biblical response, kind of trickled throughout the passage that we read over how do you deal with this in a, in a healthy way. Here's the first one. Uh, I laugh because this is like the hardest one for me. The first thing he says is, is you have to avoid being passive. You have to avoid being passive. He says, I entreat you, Yudia and Sinchiki. In other versions, he says, I plead with you. But then he goes on to say, it seems to me, based on the context, that he's saying the elders, the pastors of the church, need to intervene and help these women figure it out. The idea is, is that conflict cannot be ignored. It has to be confronted. And you say, well, well, I don't know about that, Daniel. That makes me uncomfortable. Here's the truth, y'all. Paul's so passionate about that, he's putting it in a letter that they read publicly. And you know, that's not him being gossipy or cruel or mean. But when they read this letter publicly, it was kind of like, well, this is unavoidable at this point. Let's talk about it. And they would have had to talk about it. So we can't be passive. And there's a problem with being passive. I want to read a verse to you. This is from Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Here's what it says. It says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So I want to make just a really simple observations. All Christians have a responsibility of doing the hard work of being peacemakers. And y'all, you know, there's a bad definition of peace. There's some people who think that peace means you're never arguing or fighting, and that's not true. Because you and I both know, like you could be in a room with somebody and be really angry at them and fighting, but not actually verbally fighting. Like there could be like a, a written agreement of peace, but you're just on the edge of a war, <laughs> you know? So that's not the best definition. So the idea of peace is, is that we have tranquility, we have a unity in the midst of our brokenness, that we seek to love one another and try to be like-minded for the glory of God, even in the midst of us being different. Which means you and I should be people that pursue peace. We should be people who bring peace into this world in which we live. We should be gentle and kind and at the same time truthful and honest. And here is what the Bible says in Galatians 2. There are times that peace will not take place unless you're willing to fight. Because in Galatians chapter 2, the Bible says that Paul confronted Peter to his face, the apostle Peter. See, Peter had developed this uh, people-pleasing attitude that he was not going to eat with Gentiles. That he was going to be more Jewish than Christian, and so he was going to avoid those Gentiles, and he wasn't going to hang out with them. And Paul says in Galatians 2, which was a public letter that would have been read, that Paul went to his face in a public format and said, that's wrong. The gospel is for all people in all places, and you need to repent of that, Peter. And because of that conflict, the early church was able to 
balanced the way it was supposed to be. So can we have just a really practical conversation when we talk about being passive? I, I think it's practical. My guess is most of you have a particular personality type that makes you lean one direction and either makes this hard for you in one way or the other, but all of us lean one particular direction. So let's just say this side over here, you're, you're in my, this is my category, okay? You're my people. You're passive. So your first instinct is, is when there's conflict, I will avoid it. I am skilled at avoiding conflict. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like I've got that down easy. You need to avoid a conversation, we're the people that can do it, no problem whatsoever. We hate conflict. Conflict is like one of the most draining, difficult things to us. And there's some of you in this room, this is the way that you're wired, and you're like, well, maybe they could just figure it out. I'm going to pray, let go, and let God. And Paul's like, no, that's not how it works. You've got you to deal with it, you know? Then others of you are over here on this side, and you are all about the justice, you know? You are all about, there are some things that are right and wrong, and if you are wrong and nobody else will say it to you, by God's grace, I will tell you to your face that you are wrong, you know? I'm not saying these people love conflict, but sometimes they love conflict, you know what I'm saying? Like, like they're not afraid of it. And here's God's sense of humor. So I, I'm, I've been married for 12 years. I'm over here, and my wife is over here. So when we first got married, uh, I'd be mad at Audrey for days, sometimes weeks, and I'd be like, I just, won't, I just won't tell you. I don't talk to you like anything, like anything to me, you know? And then my wife is like, when she's mad, like, oh, I know. <laughs> like, it's no debate, you know? Like, like when I'm mad, she doesn't know because I don't tell her. But when she's mad, I'm aware, you know? Uh, and God made us, got us married. And now we're, we've kind of figured it out. Uh, we have figured it out. I'm just joking. You guys get the gist, right? So we have these personality types when it comes to conflict that complicate us doing it God's way. And what the text is saying is, is that you and I need to be willing to confront things when it needs to be confronted. We need to not be passive. We've got to be able to do it. And you say, well, okay, well, how do I figure that out? Because here's what it really comes down to. Here's the struggle in our hearts. On one side, there's a desire for justice, which is right and wrong. But over here is the desire for mercy. And hear me, we want mercy. Agreed? But we also want justice. So how do we reconcile those two things? Well, the best way to reconcile it is through the person of Jesus. The best way to think about the justice of God and the mercy of God is in the incarnation and the life and example of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was never out of balance. He was always perfect when it came to this. So, for example, there are passages in the Gospels, like in John 2, where Jesus goes into the temple, he makes a whip, and he commits an act of violence against corrupted religious leaders that were stealing from people in the name of God. And he literally whips them as an act of justice. Let's just say the people over here are like, finally, like that's their favorite verse. You're like, like show them, you know. But then there's this passage at the end of John where Peter has completely abandoned Jesus. Like, like I'm not going to deny you, Jesus, Peter says. Three times he does it before the end of the day. He just abandons Christ on the worst day ever. And Jesus interacts with him, and it's not an act of violence, it's not an act of justice. Jesus looks at Peter, and he shows mercy, and he restores Peter to the mission that God has for him. And you see this constant character balance in the ministry of Jesus, where there's times he confronts sins aggressively, and there's times that he shows mercy. You say, well, what's all that got to do with conflict in the church? Here's where it fleshes out. Our goal and desire is not to be true to yourself. That's horrible for our church. It's horrible for your marriage. You want to ruin your life, say be true to yourself. That assumes you're awesome. But the Bible says that we're not awesome. It says that we're broken. So the answer to this is not be true to yourself. The answer to our lives is to look like Jesus. And here's a starting point. If you want to know if you look like Jesus, foundational starting point, you're probably not as close as you think you are. Does that make sense? So if the posture of your heart is to say, if you're over here to say, there are times you should show mercy, and there's times you probably should overlook sins, and you don't do that very well. And if you're over here like me, there are times that you need to have the conversation. God wants you to have the conversation. Everybody in the room knows you should have the conversation, but you're avoiding it. And we want to say, Jesus is my example, and I want to look like Jesus. Because we don't want to avoid conflict. We want to do it the way that God has called us to. Here's a second thing from that Romans passage that I think is fascinating. And I hope this encourages many of you guys. That there are times that peace is not possible. 
which is why Paul says in Romans, if possible, try to be at peace with all men, which is pretty clear that there are going to be moments that you will look like Jesus. You will do the right thing when it comes to trying to pursue peace. But the people that you're interacting with won't care about God's truth. They won't care about what's right and wrong. And they will be true to themselves. And they'll abandon it. And the relationship will just suffer because of it. So I'm just saying, like, like, like it's okay if, if it's not able to be peace. Our responsibility is not to control people. Our responsibility is just to be faithful to what God has called me to do. And there's freedom in that. That if we would just obey God, we can entrust those people who don't want peace to Him. The third principle from this, Romans, or from this passage is that there are times that you and I may need to seek outside counsel. Now remember, going back to the Philippians passage, these two women are in conflict with one another, and as far as we could tell, they couldn't figure it out. They, have just, they just hit a dead end. And what Paul says is it's time for somebody to step in. It's time for some kind of neutral third party that's not going to pick it aside. They're not going to take up an offense, the way Proverbs says. And they are going to give them some wisdom and guidance of how they should navigate this. So if you say, what are some practical examples of that today? Well, I think Christian counseling is one of the greatest gifts that we have to the church. And maybe you're here and you're a Christian and you're like, I'm a mature Christian. I don't go see counselor. And I want to lovingly just say that's dumb. If you think you're on varsity because you never need counseling, then you like... Come on. Come on, guys. Let's, let's be real. Uh, every single person in this room, if you're a Christian, at some point may need to seek counsel. And you may be wrong for not seeking counsel because we're of our pride. And so we need at times to go seek counsel. I've got a counselor that I saw the whole time I was in Tampa, about a couple times a year, just to sit and to vent and to talk through things. A second third party that you could involve is some kind of pastor or elder in the church. Uh, and the third group, I would say, is find somebody who's older and wiser than you and seek their counsel. And I'm going to say this jokingly, but find somebody who gets an early bird special. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And sit down with them and let them offer the wisdom from the experience that they have inside of their life. The, the point is, is that before you give up, before you say that peace isn't possible, which could happen, you try to exhaust all of your options to try and be reconciled. Um, Y'all think a, a fairly decent example of this is so over the last few years, I've done my fair share of pre-marriage counseling. I don't know why. It's just I was a singles pastor for like six years, so a lot of some people have gotten married, and so I do a lot of pre-marriage counseling. And uh, there was always these extremes when it came to fighting when I would do this. Audrey and I, we always do it together, this counseling. Uh, there, there's couples who, like, they're always fighting, like, all the time. And then that's like a complicated conversation because you're like, it ain't going to get better when you get married. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, like it's probably just going to get harder and worse. So like, like, let's talk through if you're going to do it God's way or if there's another conversation that needs to happen. But what's, this has happened to me on more than one occasion. You'll sit down with couples, and they've been dating for like six months to a year, sometimes longer, and they're like, we've never gotten an argument ever, you know? And so I'm like, automatically, I'm like, oh, that's a red flag. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like you've been together for six months, and you've never gotten an argument. That means one of two things. Either one, you are in the honeymoon period, which psychologists say is a real thing, where you're dating. If you're single, this is just be careful of this. You're dating, and you have blinders on. All that you can see is the awesome thing about that person, and you don't see anything bad about them. And literally, they, they figured it out that it's somewhere between uh, nine months to 18 months when that goes away. And then when it goes away, then you're like, oh my gosh, the person I'm with is pretty terrible or whatever, you know. Uh, so maybe you're in the honeymoon period. But most of the time, most of the time, for a pre-couple that's engaged to get married, they've been mad. They've just balled it up. They never say it. So in the counseling session, we basically tell them, we're like, we want you guys to argue. Because there are things that you do when you get mad. There's things that you do when you get frustrated that you, they need to know before you marry them. They don't need to go into marriage blindly with that. And so normally we'll say, this is normally the question where we can provoke some like, conversation. Is like, Especially if they come from Christian families, it's like, okay, well, here's a question. Where are you going to wake up Christmas morning? Or are you going to go Thanksgiving Day? And normally it's like, oh, well, we haven't talked about that yet. And you're like, okay. So that's the point, right? Like, and our encouragement to these young couples getting married is to say, like, like if we can wrestle with this with a neutral third party right now, like, God's, like, we can help you. Like, if you would listen and be teachable, it could be good for you. I think that's the idea in what he's saying here. He's saying that, like, they're fighting and they're at odds with each other and they can't seem to figure it out. But if a third party would step in, it would be beneficial to them.
Then he goes on in the Philippians passage where he says, remember your past together before that point in time where you got into the disagreement. So he says to them, you've labored side by side in the gospel together. That you've labored side by side in the gospel with other Christians in the church. He wants them to see that they have more in common in their past that bonds them together than they have things that disagree with them, disagree with one another. I think simply put, he's saying that the mission of God is more important than either of you ladies being right. A really important passage is Galatians 3. Here's what it says, uh, 26 through 29. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Here's what, here's what that's saying. It's saying that in the body of Christ there's diversity. We're from different ethnic, ethnicity backgrounds. We're from different races. We're from different social classes. We have different amounts in our bank account. But in Jesus, we have a commonality in the gospel. We're unified in the gospel. And what Paul is saying to them is, Paul is saying, fix your eyes on that. Like you're thinking of all the ways that you disagree and all the ways that they've mishandled that disagreement. And Paul is encouraging them to look back in the past of all that God has done in the midst of their lives. Y'all, this is important because I don't know about you. Maybe you don't do this. But in the midst of conflict, Sometimes I can get so mad I have blinders on. And in a conflict, the only single thing that I can see about this person that is my brother or sister in Christ is how wrong they are. And I can completely forget the redeemable qualities that they have or the positive things that they've done in the past in my relationship with them. It's like all we can see is how wrong they are and how right we think we are. And what Paul is saying is he's saying resist that urge Don't just try to be right. Focus on what you have in common. Y'all, I've been doing this thing uh, over the last couple of years, is when I'm frustrated with a person and I find myself wanting to just dislike them, I try to remind myself of all the godly things that they've done towards me or in the church that I'm a part of. I I try to think of in my, when I'm wanting to vent in my head, because remember, I'm passive, so I have arguments in my head, fictitious ones, where I always win. And so, so when I'm doing that in my head, I've tried to pause and say, but like, but they're not evil. They're like, they're my brother, they're my sister in Jesus, and what are things that they do that I love about them? And for some reason, that helps me not be as critical as I think I can normally be. Here's the last thing that I see in the text is he says that we have to learn to endure with one another. The way that I think he says that is, is he says, be reminded that your names are in the book of life. You know, the book of life is simply a reference to you and I if we know Jesus. It's a reference to the hope of eternity. It's the hope of heaven. It's the hope of being with Christ forever because we have put our faith in the death and resurrection of Christ. And when we do that and we believe this good news, the Bible says that we're born again and our names are written in the book of life. And what he's saying to these ladies is, don't forget that. And if I could simplify it as as like basic as I can, here's what he's saying. He's saying if your names are written in the book of life, that means the Bible teaches that God has adopted you into his family. Like, he's now your father. And if God has adopted you into his family, and he's put your name in the book of life, then that means you are siblings. You're brothers and sisters in Christ. It means your family. And the way that we love family is different than the way that we love anybody else. Because the love that we have for family is deep. And you know what I've realized about conflict, y'all? It is way easier when I love them. Do you know what I've realized about conflict? If I don't love them, it's easy for me just to not like them. So let me give you like a really practical example of that. Have you seen the way that people talk to each other on Facebook and Twitter? 
I promise you I don't talk to my dad like that or my brothers like that or my wife like that, generally speaking. The boldness that people have behind a computer is embarrassing, especially when they claim the name of Jesus. And do you know why people talk like that on the internet? It's super nerdy because I'm, I'm a dad. There's a movie called uh, Wreck-It Ralph where he breaks the internet, and there's a scene where they're like, don't ever read the comments. If you get to the comments, it's going to do nothing but hurt your feelings. Do you know why people do that? Because we don't love people, each other. And it's easy to say whatever you want, however you want, with no regard when you don't love people. But when you love people, you're careful, and you're wise, and you're caring in how you say things. You're a peacemaker. Agreed? And the Bible says if you're here and you're a Christian, we're family. And not to wear out the Disney analogies, but look, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Lilo and Stitch. But in the movie Lilo and Stitch, uh, there's a word, ohana. How many of you guys have heard that word before, ohana? Um, so the whole meaning of the movie is that you have these kids that are essentially orphans. We don't know where their parents are. And then there's this weird alien thing from another world that's essentially an orphan. But they find each other, and the word of the movie is ohana, which means family, because you never give up on family. You always fight for family. And here's the truth. You and I have to fight for unity because we're family. So what makes this church different than everybody else? The only thing that I can think that makes us different is I genuinely love you, and I pray that you would genuinely love one another. That you would be willing to fight for peace. You would be willing to let things go sometimes for the glory of God. But we're family. We were orphans, spiritually speaking, but God has adopted us into his family. So you know, when I was a, a, a pastor uh, in Plant City, uh, we did this thing where um, everybody was like fighting in our group, or at least that's how I perceived it. I was a singles guy, and it just seemed like in my living room and in my office, there was just like tension between a lot of people in our church. So, so our singles ministry, we go on this retreat. <laughs> this is messed up, but it totally, like by God's grace, it works. So we go on this retreat, and on that retreat, I teach for 45 minutes on the unity of the church. And then I get done, and I look at our people, and I say, I don't feel like we're unified. I feel like there's tension between many of you. And so what we're going to do for the next two hours is you, if you have tension with people in this body, you're going to go talk to them directly. And you're going to, by God's grace, seek it because we're a family. And families sometimes fight for unity. You should have seen the looks on their face. Well, anyway, it, was, it, was un, it was uncomfortable for about 10 minutes. But y'all, as uh, the next two hours, as I walked around the, that place that we were staying, there were people in our ministry that were having hard conversations that needed, they needed to have for months. Because there's value in actually doing conflict the way that God says that we ought to. So here's what I want to close out, a very practical step for us as a congregation. I'm going to put my cell phone number up on the screen. And here's what I want you to do. If you'll pull your, go ahead and pull your cell phones out right now. Let's all do this together. Uh, my guess would be, that you may be in conflict with somebody right now. Or maybe you have in your past that was never resolved. And so here's what I want you to do. I want to ask you if you would text the name of that person. You don't have to put their last name. You want to keep it private? That's cool. Text the name of that person to me. Nobody's going to see it but me. I'll have my eyes on it. Nobody else. If you need to put Daniel H on there, that's fine. It's whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, like send it to me. And here's why. I want to pray over that name. Like I've recognized relationships are hard. They're rough. They're rough because we're sinful and they're difficult. And then I want to ask you if you've done three, three steps. So whatever name you send me, here's how I'm going to pray for you specifically. I'm going to pray and ask, have you taken the initiative to be the pursuer of peace? And the book of Matthew is clear. If you are the one that has offended them, like you're wrong, the Bible says that you should actually leave church to go make it right. Like, Leave the altar and go repent in front of them if you're the offender. offender. So I'm going to pray that you've done that if you're the offender. But if they've sinned against you, the Bible actually says that you should go to one with the prayer to restore them and tell them where they're wrong. And so no matter who's right or who's wrong, my prayer is that name on that list is that you've already had that conversation with them. My second prayer is that if you have gotten to an impasse with that person, that you have sought counsel from a neutral third party. So either a pastor or a counselor or 
uh, some, an older, wiser Christian, that you have pursued those steps. And if you say, Daniel, the name I'm going to send you, I've, I've, I've taken that first step, I've confronted it, or I've, I've confessed it. And two, we've sought counsel. And here's the third thing I'm going to pray, that you would find a way to entrust that relationship to the Lord. And as that relationship changes in a permanent way that could be difficult or hard, I pray that you would let God be in control and rest in his providence when it comes to relationships. So James is going to sing. They're going to lead us in a time of, of worship. And I want to pray for you guys. And if you'll send me those names, I'll pray. And look, I'm going to be up here to the side. My friend Eddie's going to be over here. If you say, Daniel, look, I'd love to talk to a pastor today. Uh, maybe you don't want to come forward during this. That's fine. But at any point today, I would just say, find me, text me. It's going to be a lot of names on my phone. So chances are I'm not going to text back details of every single debate. But just know that I want to pray over those names and pray over your lives.